Well, hey, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. This is TAM Lab number 112, uh, getting started with SaltStack Config and Windows Minions. And this session today is uh, being run by Brian Wilkner, one of our staff TAMs here. Um, and so with that, Brian, uh, it's over to you. Thanks, Bill. All right, let me uh, go ahead and kind of set the stage here a little bit. Uh, so I've been trying to get started with uh, SaltStack Config in a lab. Um, and so uh, kind of want to talk through today, you know, how to get SaltStack Config deployed. We're actually going to walk through maybe two different scenarios of deploying it. The one being kind of the more common way that you would deploy it in a vSphere environment. And, and then based on a, a challenge that uh, Guy had thrown out earlier, uh, we're also going to deploy it in VMware Workstation. And then the, the bulk of the demo today will be actually done in VMware Workstation, uh, just to kind of, you know, um, make the barrier to entry of, of getting started with this even lower, right? You don't necessarily need access to a vSphere environment. Uh, we're we're going to do this all kind of, you know, just nested inside of VMware Workstation. Uh, so with that, we'll go ahead and break out of these slides here, and we'll uh, we'll start with, you know, what I would call the normal way of getting um, uh, SaltStack config deployed. So it, it ships as a virtual appliance, but this is part of the vRealize suite. Specifically, it comes as part of the vRealize automation entitlement. Uh, so, you know, if we're you know, consuming that as part of the suite, we could deploy those products using the vRealize suite lifecycle manager. So we'll start in that system here. Uh, we'll go to lifecycle operations, and we'll just go in to create a new environment. Uh, we'll give this a name. Uh, we'll call it TamLab112. We have to pick a data center and a default password. Um, and that, that's everything for this environment. You know, if we had an existing environment that had VRA or VROPS or some other component of the vRealize suite in it, we could use that. Uh, but for demo purposes, we're just going to start with a, a new environment here. And as you can see, you know, in the list of products that we can deploy with the vRealize suite, um, one of them is SaltStack Config. Um, we're not actually going to deploy it. I already have one of these uh, in the lab. Um, it's telling me here that I have no product binaries mapped. It gives me instructions on how to go you know, download SaltStack Config. So vRealize suite lifecycle manager has it to deploy. But the, the pieces I really wanted to touch on today were uh, you know, this uh, these options of doing uh, a new install or an import. So the import would be if I've already deployed you know, the, the appliance just through vSphere or something like that. Uh, we get to pick you know, a version. And then you know, these two choices are, are the ones uh, to really kind of touch on, right? So in this lab, we're going to deploy this in a standalone fashion. Uh, there is a way to do VRA integration, but you know, we want to focus on just that salt stack config piece. And you know, sometimes when we, when we do these integrations, right, it, it, it's easy to lose track of where one product stops and the other product picks up. So for purposes of this demo, we're going to do just the standalone installation. Um, my understanding, and I haven't actually gone through this workflow, um, is that if you deploy standalone and then down the road you want to integrate it, you would actually go into VRA. There's an integration section. You'd add your information for SaltStack Config, and you could you know tie these together after the fact. Uh, but to get started, we're just going to do standalone. Uh, there's a drop down here for deployment type. There's only one choice in it, so that makes it uh, super easy. Uh, so from here, you know, we would say, you know, next, next, um, you know, it's going to ask us a bunch of questions about the cluster we want to put the VM in and, you know, where's our SSL certificate, what IP address do we want to give it. Um, but the, the wizard's fairly intuitive. I just wanted to kind of touch on, you know, this, this is part of the suite and we can deploy it with the, the suite's lifecycle management tools. Uh, any questions before we move on? I, the, the next step is you know, kind of talking through the same workflow on how to do the, um, the deployment inside of Workstation. But I'd like to pause and see if there's any questions related to lifecycle management. Well, um, I have a question I guess... about the SaltStack config. I, my understanding is when deployed through lifecycle manager, there's a theoretical limit of the appliance size that gets deployed. Are you familiar with that? Uh, so when it deployed, it was a very large appliance. I, I want to say that it had 16 CPUs and 32 gig of RAM, which 
probably isn't large if you're in an enterprise, but when you're deploying it in a home lab, that, that is uh, uh, quite a bit of resources. Um, I, I think there's some sizing info here. I, I want to say there, there's a KB article that, that digs into how you would size it and stuff. Um, but I, I do think there is an ability to do like a scale out kind of deployment. Um, but again, I, I haven't dug into that and you know, kind of wanted to keep the scope of this just, just getting started on, on how to use some of these bits before we uh, grow it up and make it super big. Gotcha. Thank you. Hey, did you have a question as well, Bill? I, well, I, I was you. just going to actually make a comment. And if for anybody who hasn't used LCM or is not very familiar with it, um, you know, that whole product binaries, you know, means that if it's not mapped, LCM doesn't know where the actual install files are. So there's a whole separate process to go to um, customer connect and download those files either automatically or manually. Um, and they are based on a specific version. So um, this is not, it's not an error that you're seeing here. Um, it's just a matter of, oh, I just need to go tell LCM to go grab those files. Yeah, I guess, you know, to piggyback on that, right, you know, in some places, you're not going to have all of these components. So downloading all of the bits to deploy all of the products probably doesn't make sense, right? You have to maintain those, store them on disk, all that kind of stuff. So if you're not going to use some of these features, um, you can just kind of eliminate doing the downloads. Uh, and so I actually had to go in and, and delete the download. I had already mapped it once before. I had to remove it just because I wanted that, you know, uh, it's I guess it's not an error, right? The instruction text that appears that lets you know what you need to do. I, I to make sure that that showed up yep. uh, for the first time. Cool. Well, um, I'm going to close this tab out. We're going to say we're done with lifecycle management. And then I'm going to share some slides. Instead of deploying this in workstation, I just kind of want to talk through the process, right? It's uh, kind of similar to what LCM is going to ask us for. It's going to ask for host names and passwords and you know, IP addresses and all that good stuff. And so th these are the boxes it asks for. I filled them all out here. Um, but the problem is, and I'll go here. I've got some build slides. Um, you know, I, I mentioned the appliance has 16 vCPUs and 32 gig of RAM. Um, my laptop's actually not capable of powering that on uh, because I've only got uh, a total of 12 physical core, well, six physical cores with hyper threading on the laptop. So the, the VM couldn't power on. Uh, so I, I get this error message. And then I get the second error message um, where it says it couldn't configure the, the VM. And I think this configure is actually applying those OVF properties from the previous screen where we you know, entered our IP address and whatnot. Because what I noticed was when I first um, got this appliance booted up, it had like a default IP address and the password that I set didn't work. So I wasn't able to log in. There was actually a banner on the top of the screen that, that told me how I could configure an IP address. Uh, but since it didn't use my you know, password that I had supplied, uh, I wasn't really sure how to log in. Uh, but I did find some, some documentation, the default password when, when stuff fails um, from, from like a deployment perspective from that OVA, the default password is just VMware all lowercase. So I was able to log in as root and then um, this uh, command line wizard yeah, it, when I ran this, this is what was actually on the screen after deploying the, the appliance. It said that I needed to configure networking and this was the command to do it. Uh, so I just ran this command here and it brought up like a uh, wizard driven command line thing and asked for the same information, IP address, DNS server, all that kind of stuff. Um, so just wanted to capture this just because it's uh, a, a little bit weird, right? It's kind of uh, uh, off-roading, if you will, uh, because this isn't, you know, uh, it probably isn't a super common way to uh, deploy stuff like this into Workstation. Uh, so, so this is just kind of more of a, an aside on if, if you wanted to get started in Workstation, um, th these are some of the, um, the steps that you'd want to, to take a look at. Um, so I'll go ahead and break out of those slides. It's more of a temporary thing. And then we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and jump into um, the web interface here. Let me actually log out. I any questions before we get into kind of the next piece? So um, where we are right now then is, so you've had it deployed in Workstation. And at this point, it's largely the same experience that we would have had we deployed to vSphere using the vRealize uh, lifecycle manager, correct? As a standalone? 
Exactly. Yep. Okay. The the LCM path will do all of that configuration for us. The IP address assigns fine. Like we're able to get to it. Everything was good. Um, it, it was just the, the workstation stuff threw yep. a little bit of a wrinkle in it, but I, I thought it was worth talking on. You know, guy mentioned it as a, uh, hey, it sure be nice if I could demo this without needing an actual lab uh, and just being able to use my PC. So I, I thought it was worthwhile to go down those steps. Challenge um, accepted. I love it. Okay, yeah. cool. Thank you. <laughs> But yeah, so you know we've got this appliance that's that's working here. Um, you know, it boots up to this kind of blue screen, shows me what my IP address is. This is the exact same path that we would end up with uh, had we gone down the LCM route. And so, like it says, we're gonna just go to uh, this uh, IP address in a web browser. One thing I'll, I'll point out is, and you can see this in Workstation, I've only got two VMs set up. I've got my salt stack config and I've got a, a server 2022 box that we're going to use as our minion. Um, I, I didn't bother setting up DNS or anything. These uh, appliances here, if I come in and look at the settings in Workstation, the network adapter is actually connected to a host only network. So, it, you know, these two VMs can only talk to each other and my workstation. Um, so it's kind of in a little bubble, if you will, uh, and can't get to anything like a name server, right? So uh, we're gonna be using IP addresses in, in a bunch of places where I would normally recommend using host names and whatnot. Uh, but again, for the purposes of keeping it small and getting started with kind of the minimum, minimum footprint that we would need, um, we're just gonna do some, some IP address stuff here. So we got our web interface up and we'll log in as our root user account here. And it lands us on this page that talks about minions, right? So, so the minions are the machines that we are going to manage with this salt stack config instance. Um, and so there's a couple of different ways that you can get those deployed. There's like an agentless path. Um, again, it, it, when I was getting started, it felt like the agent was the most direct path of, of actually putting uh, this minion software on the machines that I wanted to manage. Uh, so, so that's the path we're going to uh, kind of demo in here. Uh, but just be aware there are um, other options. And so I think the first step, you know, on, on getting this uh, going is to get this minion software in here. It'll take a second to install. So we'll, we'll kick off the install and then we'll come back and kind of talk through what we're seeing here in the screen right now. So we'll look at the console of our Windows VM. And I'm just going to go make some sort of like uh, temp folder here. And then uh, I'm going to get my Windows Minion software and just copy it over here. Um, that went quicker than I thought it would. But let me let me fire open this one page here. All right. So this is um, where we get the minion from. So if you, I just Googled, you know, Windows minion for salt stack config, and I found this page, right? And so it's just the, the executable that you would need to do the install. I'm doing it on, you know, 64 bit Windows. So I got the second file here um, and just downloaded it and had it kind of pre staged uh, and just copied it to um, my Windows VM using whatever tool that, that, you know, I have available to get the file over here. Um, yeah, if we go down that integration path, I've, I've seen some pretty slick demos where the salt stack minion actually gets it, you know, installed as part of a VRA deployment process, right? So if we're starting out from the, the very beginning and we have some integration set up, you know, we, we may not need to figure out how to get this minion installed inside of Windows, right? We can automate that you know, before or you know, during the, the VM deployment piece. But we've got our, our minion software on here right now, or at least the installer for it. So we're just going to fire open uh, Windows command line here. And um, I'm going to copy this and paste it here. All right. So um, this is saying, you know, our executable, and then I'm passing in the master name as a command line argument and then telling it that I want to do a silent install, right? If I hadn't gone down this command line route, right, I could have just double clicked on that executable. It, it asks, you know, what, what is the name of your, uh, you know, salt stack master. You would type in the name. In this case, I'm typing in an IP address because I have no name resolution. And you would go through the wizard, you know, next, next finish, uh, pretty straightforward Windows installer. Um, but, you know, 
just so we can move on, I'm going to kick this off. Yeah, see, I thought that might happen. You're not in temp. Oh, yeah, that, that too. Um, I had some weird uh, behavior the other day when I was trying to run a executable in PowerShell, so I thought that's what the message was. There we go. So it's kicking off. It's actually running in the background. We can fire up Task Manager here um, and let this run. Uh, but we can see that it's doing some stuff. Um, but we'll let it keep doing that stuff. We'll come back to this here in a second. Um, and we'll close out of this tab. We'll go back to our salt stack config web page here. We're looking at a list of minions. Um, right now we only see you know one item in here, right? Because our our install isn't finished. But the one item that we see is the salt master, right? That's the the appliance that we deployed and, and gave this um, you know dot forty IP to, which is what we're looking at right now. And you know specifically, we're looking at a target of all minions, and so we would see a list of everything in this page. Um, but as you can see, there are some other targets, right? Like uh, different flavors of Linux, some of Windows. There's even a button here where we can create a new target. Um, and so the, the target is just kind of a collection of stuff that we may want to apply things to, right? Wh whether that's a, a job or some sort of um, command or whatnot. Um, and so if we wanted to create our own target, um, what we, what we could use, and here we'll just go ahead and click create target. It talks about these grains, right? Um, so what is a grain, right? Or where do I get a list of grains? So if we click on this link to the one minion we have, we can see that these grains are basically properties of all of the you know, stuff, the virtual machine in this case, right, right? We could put this minion on a physical box if we wanted to, but all of the information that it collects uh, gets sent back and kind of populated as this grain, this, this kind of property, if you will. So, you know, our OS version, if this were Windows, it would show us that it's, you know, server 2022 um, in this OS full name. Um, you know, there, there's properties in here about how much memory this thing has, how many CPUs it has, um, stuff like that. So if we're back on this minion screen and we were creating a new target, right? We could say something about, um, I want everything that has a CPU model of X and an OS of Y. I want it all in a group all by itself, right? And so um, we, we could create various targets uh, that, that we would use to actually deploy these tasks to. Uh, for our demo, right, it's super small. Um, you know, so we're, we're, we're just going to you know, focus everything on Windows servers because we only got the one minion and it happens to be a Windows server. Um, but you know, for example, if you had um, you know, VMs that followed a certain naming convention and you wanted to say if it's a Windows box that starts with you know, dev, for example, uh, you could create a target over here of you know, dev Windows you know, over four gig of RAM if that were uh, you know, some criteria that were important to you, right? We, we could create a target with, with multiple um, you know, criteria and those criteria would map uh, most likely to grains. Uh, so these properties that we're, we're collecting here. Um, any, any thoughts or questions on that before we kind of go see how our install's going? Well, I, I, I guess I would just comment that that concept of the grain is really important for in a number of different areas, right? Um, so I'm glad you highlighted that because I think that's something that we kind of gloss over, uh, just casually glancing through and like trying to figure out, you know, how do we use this thing? Um, so I, thank you for, for calling that out. Yeah, no worries. Cool. So uh, if we jump back to our Windows machine, things look like they kind of slowed down here. We, we don't see high CPU anymore. Um, so I think our minions already installed. If we come back over here uh, and you know, refresh this page, we still don't see it in a list of all minions. Um, but we do have a little warning here or a tip that we have pending minion keys that need to be reviewed. Right, and so what it's saying is that it sees that we installed this minion, but we haven't really said, do we trust this? Like, do, do we want it to be part of our, um, our, our salt stack config environment? 
And so, you know, I, I mentioned some of those demos that, that show the VRA integration. Um, they're, they're pretty slick, right? They get the minion installed, they get the key that, you know, it, it sends, and then they auto approve it, right? Because it's deployed through VRA, and we want all of those pieces to be connected. But in this case, where we're just doing everything standalone, right? We, we see our key that's in here, uh, and we can just go ahead and hit accept. Um, and so that'll that'll do what it needs to do. It'll start collecting those grains in the background and all that kind of stuff. Now I have, um, it's just part of kind of random testing, went through and uninstalled a minion and you know deleted all of the bits that the minion had um, you know, put in the guest. Um, and then I came back and reinstalled it. And when you do that kind of path where you've removed a minion and the key changes, uh, it doesn't actually show up in this pending section. It shows up in this denied section, right? Because it, it realizes the, the minion is the same as a minion it's seen before based off of host name or that, that primary identifier, this, this minion ID, which by default is host name. And so it sees that I've uh, used that before, but the key that it is expecting is different than the key that I actually provided. So it kind of shows up in a different area over here. Uh, so just you know something to be kind of mindful of as you're you know working through these minions. If you're waiting for it impending and you don't see it, um, you, you may want to check one of these other kind of buckets. Denied's the one I've um, seen it in, but if you know instead of hitting accept, if I had accidentally hit reject, we could go in here and, and re-approve it. But now that we bounce back to accepted, right? We did accept this server 2022A uh, minion, so it's in here now. And like I mentioned, if we click on it, uh, you know, a lot of these grains have been populated. So we have host names and IP addresses and all of that good stuff uh, that we would expect that that's coming from that, um, that minion. It's reporting these properties back in. And if we go to our minion list, we can see uh, that there are they're both in here when we look at all minions. If I look at Windows or Windows Server, I only see that one that, that we uh, intentionally deployed. Um, if we go to Linux, right, we only see the, the master appliance. And, and again, if we had more, um, you know, more minions, we would see them all in here. And I'm gonna just uh, real quick uh, bounce over to an example environment um, just to kind of show, you know, some of those, you know, uh, to your point, Bill, like the importance of some of those grains and what we can do with them, right? So like here's a custom one that I created that's, you know, Windows servers that start with a certain, um, you know, host name starts with T147 um, is only this one um, one minion. But if I look at all Windows servers, there's a handful of them, right? So we can have, um, you know, a, a bunch of different targets if, if there's some sort of collection of things that's interesting to us. Um, one thing worth noting, there's also a minion that's available for ARM. So if you have Raspberry Pis or something and you just want to mess around with that, uh, you can actually just um, install the minion over there as well uh, for Grins. If, if you have a fleet of, of Raspberry Pis you need to manage somehow. Awesome. Um, so real quick while you're transitioning back, um, there was a question in, uh, in the Q&A about is the agent extensible to collect custom grains? Um, so I did, in fact, I'll put this here in, well, you can check it out in the Q&A and we'll make sure we put it with the recording, but um, there is extensibility through this to create custom grains. So if there's a reason you need other types of properties that aren't predefined um, as grains, um, you can actually, you know, go through an effort and create those yourselves. Yeah, and, and uh, super interesting, right? Because it can be just like a, a file or something that's on the, the minion, uh, or you can have it run like code to actually go collect something. Um, I talked to a, a customer who stored like a, a chargeback you know, department billing code a, as a grain so that they could see it oh, in, in this uh, interface as well. Um, so definitely, uh, definitely a lot of options there. I did uh, uh, lose track of chat here, just skimming it real quick. Any um, Anything I missed, Bill? It seems nope, like you've been so keeping far. an eye on it. Okay, cool, thanks. Yep. All right, so we've got, uh, we've got our one minion. Um, so now what do we do with it? Um, well, the thing that um, uh, I chose to do with it, right, is if I go in here to config, right, I wanted to create some sort of, uh, job of, of something that I could do to this Windows minion. So the, the first thing that came to mind, right, um, 
you know, this being a configuration management tool, right? Like what, what kind of configuration would I maybe want to change, right? So uh, configuration could be just a text file that, that has some sort of settings in it. Um, and so to kind of demo that, uh, one thing that came to mind was a PowerShell profile, right? It's just a text file. We just put it in a very specific location on a Windows box. The next time we open PowerShell, um, it'll, you know, show that stuff, right? So I'm going to close all of these windows here because it's getting a little busy. Um, it's a PowerShell window. You know, we've got our um, uh, title bar here. That's kind of the standard title bar. And if I say, you know, CD desktop or something like that, and I've got, you know, that whole path that's just kind of listed there. Um, and the place where I need to put a PowerShell profile is here in C Windows. Uh, is it what System 32, uh, Windows PowerShell V1. Uh, and then I think it just goes right in here. It's a file called profile.ps1 is what I would, I'd want to set to have a, a system-wide PowerShell profile. And, and in that profile, I could you know, do things like change the behavior of the title bar and, and, and stuff like that if I wanted to. And so uh, just wanted to show this because you know, uh, th there is no profile.ps1 and this is a very default looking PowerShell window that we just opened, right? So, so to prove that it, it worked before we, uh, started making changes to it. So the uh, PowerShell profile that um, that I like to use, and this is just, uh, I mean, we could do a whole separate session on PowerShell and whatnot, but uh, it's actually all on GitHub in the PowerCLI example scripts repo. Um, and this is just kind of the raw text of it, but it's uh, uh, something that I saw a demo of at a VMworld several years back, but it does a handful of things, you know, puts, if, if we have PowerCLI installed on our machine, it puts the version of PowerCLI in the title bar and, and, and just, just does some things uh, around like date timestamps and the, the output that, that look kind of slick. Um, so, so this is the profile that I want to put on, let's say all of my Windows servers, right? And I'll just, you know, not just one, but let's assume for uh, uh, demo purposes that I don't have just one VM, I've got hundreds of them and yeah, I don't wanna go copy this file to all 100 of them. So what we're gonna do is create a job to you know, apply um, you know, this one managed file, uh, which is our PowerShell profile to all of our managed Windows boxes. So I've got this you know, file contents in my clipboard. I, I need to put it somewhere. Uh, and so Salt brings along with it this file server uh, that we can use. And so I'm going to create a, a thing. These, uh, I think these folders here, I think that the technical term for them is pillars, uh, but this base and SSE come just out of the box. And I'm going to create this SLS, well, actually, First, going to create a text file, right? Because in my clipboard, I have uh, my PowerShell profile, and that's just text. So I'm just going to paste that all in here. And I'm going to call it something like uh, TamLab slash, uh, um, I think I put this in my notes somewhere, and I think it matters later. So I'm just uh, going to look back. Oh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but we'll call it like PowerShell profile.ps1. So we got a new file, it's just text file. Uh, we put our text in it. Uh, we're going to put it in this SSE pillar in a folder called TamLab and then PowerShell profile. So when I hit create, um, let's see if we refresh this here page. We should see a folder over here called TamLab. Unless I did something wrong. Did you need to save the text file? Did I not hit save? I don't think uh, so. Oh, uh, well. Sorry about that. We'll change this up back over to text. We'll call it TAM Lab PowerShell Profile.ps1. Now, oh, there you go. Yeah. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, hitting that save button. Uh, maybe not in my notes, but obviously super important. So the, this is the file that we want to copy to these, um, all of these minions, right? And so what I'm going to do is create another file, uh, you know, that actually has all of our, uh, the state that we want to apply in it. So this SLS file, um, and we'll put it in the same path. We'll call it TAMLAB um, uh, 
PowerShell profile.sls, right? So this is the salt, salt um, I don't know what the L stands for, but it's the, the salt state um, uh, syntax. And what we've got is kind of the, the item of what we want to do, right? So we can have various kind of tasks in here. So we call it, you know, some sort of task name. And the task is going to be, you know, manage this file. The specific file that we want to manage, the name of it, this is the name on the local file system, right? So C Windows System 32, that, that path we were looking at. And we're telling it that the source file that we actually want to put on all of those systems is this SLS path, right? This is like a, a variable that, that basically says in the same folder that this state file is in, there should be a PowerShell profile dot ps1 um, and, and we could have just as easily you know said slash tam lab in here but I, I think this scales better right if we started moving files around or something like that and then this replace flag is set to true right if i already have a powershell profile i want to overwrite it um, and so that's just uh, uh, if, if we don't have that in there it'll uh, see the file exist and, and not overwrite and and for our purposes, you know, if we wanted to manage this file for sure and make sure it's the version that we expect, we should tell it that we want to overwrite. So we'll go ahead and hit save to that. Now we've got two files in our TAM lab folder uh, that, you know, one is the instructions on what we want to do, that we want to manage this file. And then um, the other one is the file that we want to copy out to those systems. Um, one thing to note is that uh, this stuff is space delimited. Uh, so like uh, it, it really expects the same number of, of spaces. I think I might've used tabs here. I think that works. Um, but uh, if like I have a heading like this one and then this next line isn't exactly two spaces in from, from that first line, um, it'll give you an error message, or at least that's what, what my testing showed up with. And, and all the examples I found online had uh, two spaces. So we'll say it's space delimited. Uh, and that's, uh, uh, that's the syntax here. All right, so we got our files out there. Uh, so let's go create a job here um, and tell it that this is going to be called TAM Lab PS Profile. And we are going to target uh, all of our Windows servers. And the function is going to be uh, state.apply, right? So we created that state file and we want to apply it. Um, the environment, we, we put everything in that SSE folder. So we'll pick that SSE folder. And then it's going to give us a list of state files that it sees, right? So it's just tamlab dot powershell dash profile this is that sls file that we created in our file server thing it, it sees that it's in there and it gives us that as a an option to pick um then that's it so we've got uh i call it ps profile apply it to windows servers apply the state from the sse environment uh the, the specific state file that we created earlier so we'll hit save on that um and so now we've got uh, we've got this row in here in our list of jobs, and we're just going to go ahead and say run now, and we're just going to not do any testing or anything, right? We've only got one minion. What's what's the worst we can do? So we'll <laughs> just go ahead and go ahead and run it. Um, so if we come over to activity, we see that there's something running here that's in progress, uh, and we have a job ID, so we can kind of click on that uh, job ID, and we see that uh, it's actually, uh, we clicked on in progress just in time. It, it almost had transitioned to completed, right? Because we can see that uh, there were no errors returned, but this minion has returned, right? So if we have a bunch of things every now and then, it, it'll say, you know, return equals false, right? And those are ones that just haven't run the task yet. Uh, but but this looks uh, pretty successful here. Uh, we're looking completed. We see that same kind of task is in here. So I think that's good news. We'll bounce back over to our Windows VM and we do see our profile.ps1 uh, that, that's in our file list now. It, it wasn't before when we started. So I'm gonna go ahead and just fire open PowerShell. And you can see, uh, I'm gonna say CD desktop because we did that last time. 
So you can see the, these two windows look a little bit different uh, now that we have our kind of PowerShell profile that's been applied to this machine. Um, our title bar is a little bit different. Uh, we know, you know the user account that's running PowerShell. We know what version of PowerShell, and we know that there's no version of PowerCLI installed. So that, that profile that we uh, pointed at has all of this kind of configuration in it. And you can see that um, when we change to like the desktop folder that that profile says only show me the you know the closest two folders and like hide in this case the user's path uh, but put timestamps in here uh, right see that those those will change as we hit enter right because it's got the minutes and seconds that we actually ran this kind of showing up right there for us so that's uh that's the first part of the demo i guess we'll, we'll pause any any thoughts or questions on um on what we just did there Actually, could you real quick in the on the web interface, could you load the job that completed? Like actually go to the job ID? Yeah. yeah. And one thing I want to call out because I thought this was pretty cool and I was kind of bumming around in here before. If you go to like, I think it's the raw at the top. Um, this is very much the same output you would get if you were running this from the command line properly. Um, so there's a lot of really cool information in here that... Um, you know, depending on how comfortable you are with, you know, previous versions of this, uh, you can still get that same level of visibility out. Yeah, and, and if something were to have gone wrong, right, this return section is where it tells us, you know, what, what happened, what error message were returned, stuff like that. Um, but, you know, if, if you're familiar with previous versions, which I wasn't, uh, but like a lot of the documentation that you'll find on the command line will, will have an output that looks like this. Um, so if you're, you know, finding examples online that looks like a, a format like this, you, you can actually get to it from the web interface as well. Awesome. Thank you. Cool. So that was, that was part one. We still have about 15 minutes here left. And I think, um, you know, for the, the next part of the demo, right? Uh, I want to do something maybe just a little bit heavier, right? Cause we, we deployed a big VM. We put an agent uh, on that that minion that we're managing, uh, but then we just used it to copy one one single file, right? Which is uh, a bit of overkill, right? To deploy an agent everywhere uh, just to copy a file. Um, but we'll do another example. Um, again, it's, it's not a whole lot more advanced. Uh, again, it's kind of the main component of it is copying a file, but instead of uh, just copying text, right, that is stored in one of these uh, folders that we can easily see from the web interface, um, I'd like to put a binary file over here, right, like uh, actual Windows executable or whatnot. And so trying to think of something that, that made a decent demo, uh, I, I remembered what, what seems like decades ago at this point, uh, using something called BG Info on Windows, I, I think Folks are probably familiar with it. It's been around for what seems like ever, uh, but it's that, that little command line thing that you can run uh, and get you know information put on your desktop as far as you know what the host name is and you know when the last time it booted, how much memory it has, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm sure folks are familiar with it. Um, and if you're not, um, again, it's just a pretty simple executable. Um, and so let me go ahead and, um, no, that didn't work. Let me see. Okay, here. Sorry, here, I'm messing with something on a, another screen, right? So here's BG Info. Um, and, you know, it's got this default config out of the box. But uh, for our demo, I went and made my own config here called tamlabconfig.bgi. So this BGI is our configuration file that, that says which properties we want on the screen and you know, what, what's the background color gonna be and stuff. And you can put an image in it. So I put the TamLab logo uh, in it. So, you know, the goal is to make our desktop be this kind of solid color um, and then have our TamLab logo and a, a few properties show up in the bottom right corner of the desktop. And instead of, you know, I, there's a thousand ways we could get BG info onto a Windows box, but we're going to use Salt Stack um, again. Uh, we want to learn Salt Stack, so we're taking something we know, like this BG info thing, and we're going to get it uh, dropped over there. Awesome. All right, so let's go back to um, our web interface, and let's look here in our file server. 
where is the button to put a file in here, right? Where do I put my bg uh, info.exe, right? And, and the answer is, unfortunately, there is no upload button, um, right? So uh, we're gonna have to do some stuff, right? Again, lots of options on, on how to do this stuff, um, but there still is this, this file server component inside of, um, inside of SaltStack. And, and we can use it. Um, it's just not something that we can readily get to from uh, the web interface. So I'm going to SSH into our um, salt stack config box here. And um, what we're going to do is go kind of to the root file system. There's this uh, SRV thing. And in here, we see this RAS and www folder. Um, if we create a uh, salt folder in here, that will actually get shared out as um, uh, as part of the, the salt file server. Um, so that, that's where we're going to put it. Let me drag this off the screen here. I want to make sure I get some syntax right here. So uh, I'm going to go look at one thing that I didn't copy over to my notes. So apologies here. This is... Uh, just a touch weird, and I want to make sure I get it right. Yeah, so it is serve salt. Okay, so we'll just make it, you know, we'll say a uh, new directory, we'll call it salt. That was easy. Um, we'll make another directory in here, we'll call it TAM lab, right, just to keep all of our bits kind of together, right, and if, uh, again, if we were, you know, doing this at scale, like in a customer environment, we might have different you know, business units or um, departments or something listed in here, and we'd want to keep all of their files kind of separate. Um, so we'll go into our TAM lab folder, and we will get our BG info exe and our TAM lab BGI file, and we'll get those um, put onto the um, you know, the file system, file server piece. And so we've got them out here. Um, the one piece we're missing, right, is the, um, that, that SLS, right, that salt, salt uh, syntax file that, that had the instructions of what we wanted to apply. And so we could continue to manage that uh, through here, right, under this file server, we, we could put that in one of these existing environments like this TAM lab folder. Um, You're on a different environment, I think. Oh, wrong tab. <laughs> Thanks for that. I was like, yeah. what? This, this doesn't look like anything like I was expecting. All right, so, so we could put it in here under this TAM lab. I'm just going to close this tab to keep myself from doing that again. Um, but so we've got this uh, uh, TAM lab folder. We could put our state file in here. That way we could manage it from the, um, the web server in the future, right? in this UI and it'd be pretty easy. But um, I, I decided um, to keep everything together all inside of this, you know, this folder on my file system, just so that I didn't have, you know, one piece of it in one place and another piece of it in a different place. I, I figured keeping it together sure. uh, was, was worth the uh, overhead of not being able to manage the state file from the, the web interface. I don't think there is a, uh, a right or wrong answer. Um, you know, uh, do with this what you will. Uh, but I, I kind of went down this route of just keeping it in here. So we're going to create a new file and we're just going to call it uh, bginfo.sls. All right, so uh, we use WinSCP to edit the file. I actually did this uh, a slightly different way last time, so we'll see how this works. Um, and again, um, executable and config file are just kind of managed files, right? We're telling them we want to copy this stuff to our, our Windows minion. Um, you know, Linux being a case sensitive, uh, file system, right? We want to make sure we get the case right. So like TAM lab config was all uppercase. Um, BG in the, or the B in BG info is actually uppercase um, in our BG info file. Um, but as you can tell, I'm telling it when you copy it to the destination, let's make it lowercase. Um, so Windows doesn't care, but I, I don't know. I, uh, 
we could make the source and destination different if we wanted to, right? Is the kind of the uh, what we're shooting for there. Okay, so we've got uh, uh, we've got our syntax here. We tell it that we want to copy the executable. Uh, we tell it we want to copy our configuration file, and then we have to tell it that we want to run this somehow, right? So um, I'm just setting a um, registry key to the current version run key, right? So when we log in, it'll run all of the entries in here. And so we're just creating a, a lab server BGI entry. Um, we're telling it to run, you know, tamlab bginfo.exe, pass in our command line argument of our uh, configuration file, tell it we want it to be silent and not to prompt and run right away. Um, so, so pretty basic syntax of just bginfo, but uh, basically the, uh, the pieces that are important are this is the registry key name and this is the value of the registry key. And it's just a, a string type. Um, so pretty pretty straightforward stuff from a registry perspective. Um, we are telling it to you know replace these files if they exist and to make directories if it needs to. So we'll go ahead and save that. We'll close this. We'll minimize that, and we'll look at our uh, C. Uh, we've got no TAM lab, right? We've got temp, but, but no TAM lab. And so we we'll just go double check our BG info file here. Uh, and I thought there was a view button, but whatever, edit will work. Um, so it's going to create C TAM lab, and that's where it's going to put our files. All right, so good stuff. We got our state file, we got our executable, we've got our BG info configuration file. So now we're going to come back over to our web interface and we don't really need to do anything in file server, right? Because we already got our files on the file system. Uh, we don't need to put them in one of these uh, folders that are exposed through the, the web interface. We'll go back to jobs and we'll say that we want to create another job. We'll call this one TAM lab BG info. Um, Targets, well, let's say all Windows servers again. Uh, function again is going to be state.apply. Um, we don't need to pick an environment, we'll just actually leave that blank. And then uh, for state, we'll call this tamlab.bginfo. And you can see it, it already picked that up. It, it knows that that SLS file exists out there and it just gives us that as a choice that we can pick. Um, BG info is the name of it. We're going to apply it to Windows servers. The function is state apply. We don't need an environment. And we tell it that the state is our TAM lab BG info. So that all looks good. We'll go ahead and hit save to that as well. So we've got our new task that's in here. And we'll go ahead and run that task. Um, we could do a schedule. We could say, you know, run this every day, run this, you know, whenever, right? We, we could make some sort of um, thing to make it happen. There's also some um, uh, some more advanced things that we could put in one of those config files to create like a beacon that, that says if the file changes to run the task again or, or to, to take some sort of remediation action, right? If it sees that the file gets changed. Uh, so we can actually, you know, set the, the minion to, to trigger based off of some event and, and then do something, um, right? It, it's not just for the initial deploy. Um, but if we look over here in our completed folder, we see you know, we've got uh, our BG info task that we just ran a few minutes ago, uh, has one success, nothing failed. Uh, that job is complete. Um, you know, to Bill's point earlier, we can come in here and look at this kind of raw output. We can see that it's you know, making registry key changes and copying files and just lots of things are going on. But if we bounce uh, back to our uh, window screen here, uh, we do see that we have a TAM lab folder. It's got the two files in it that we would expect, the ones that we were managing from our, um, uh, our state file. And I'm just logging out and logging back in because the, the registry key we told it to run only runs uh, you know, as part of that, uh, that run key right at login. So we'll close that tab and we'll give it just a second here. And what, what we should expect is this background will change uh, as soon as my login process finishes. 
And now we've got our TAM Lab logo in the bottom right corner. Got our host name and IP address and all that jazz kind of showing up uh, right here inside of inside of our desktop. Um, and Salt, you know, did all of the pieces, right? It copied that binary, copied the configuration file, created the registry key, did, did all of those things. Um, and you know, we, we could run it again if we wanted to, and you know, there'd be no work for it to do. So it wouldn't, you know, wouldn't do anything, but you know, we could have it run as a schedule. We could, um, we could say if somebody goes in and, for example, deletes the uh, BGI you know, configuration file or replaces it with a different version uh, to, to use a beacon to kind of phone home and say, hey, this mm -hmm. changed um, and I need you to put it back to the managed state. Awesome. Um, real quick, we do have a question uh, in Q&A. <clears throat> Does the file server functionality in Salt have an API to manage it or provide some data management functions like deleting files or... Uh, even in the web UI? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. The, um, uh, th there is an API. I, I've, I've played around with it a little bit, actually created a, a PowerShell module that interfaces with the API that, that's actually out on that same uh, VMware you know, PowerCLI community repo. Uh, so if you wanted to hit something on the API, get data back, you know, how, how did, you know, what was my job state, what failed, you know, stuff like that. Can I get a list of all of the uh, minion cache, uh, stuff like that. Uh, there's some functions that, that I created for that. Uh, I haven't actually tried to delete anything from the file server. I assume it's possible. Uh, but like I said, there, there's a lot of, a lot of stuff that API does. Let me look here in the, uh, this web interface, because I don't know if I've ever tried to delete something from here. Um, I can't right click. There oh, is there's, a there's a delete button. Yeah, um, whatever. I can delete this PowerShell profile. I don't care. Yeah. Um, so since we can do it from the UI, I bet there's a way to do it from the API. Um, I haven't, you know, specifically done that. I honestly hadn't deleted it from the UI, <laughs> but uh, I, I would expect that there, there's a way to do that from from the API. Okay, and then um, one other question that was um, asked earlier, and we just didn't slot it in at the right time. Um, when you were talking about that SLS um, file or the, the the format of that file with the spacing, um, the question was, is that Jinja? Um, like as the, as that language and yes, it is. So, um, okay. if you're familiar with Jinja <laughs> and yeah, whatever requirements, uh, they have for, uh, format, um, SLS is based on Jinja. Okay. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, you know, salt's been around for a while, right. You know, it, it's maybe new to a lot of VMware folks. It was new to me, right. Because VMware recently acquired it, but this thing has existed for quite some time. And there are just a lot of examples. Uh, sometimes, you know, the, the, the struggle for me was like, I've got this SLS syntax, right? Like I, it shows me how to copy a file, but where do I put that? And, and so that was, you know, <laughs> that was the piece I struggled with, right. The, the examples are, are plenty. Um, the, the mechanics of, of where they went, what's the, the piece that uh, that I was hoping to cover or had to fill in the blanks on uh, to, to get, you know, get started with this myself. Awesome. Well, thank you for that. Cool. Well, I think that's, uh, that's the end of the demo. I don't see any new questions in there. Um, well, yeah. You know, Brent, I appreciate you going through the effort of running this in Workstation because, you know, to the challenge and you know what we're seeing here is you don't necessarily have to have a massive set of infrastructures to run something like this um and it's extremely capable now not to say that we want to run this in prod right on vmware workstation but to get our hands dirty and start understanding this more it is an option and kind of given the options or the the off-roading that you did earlier that certainly helps but it's you know this is extremely capable uh for us to to learn uh, without a massive investment, uh, which is really nice too. Yeah, it was a fun challenge, and I I, I agree. It does you know make it easier to to test, and you know honestly, it, it probably makes sense to have a little sandbox like this, right? To you know, even if you're going to go do it in production, you know, in vSphere at at real scale, like I'm going to go try and apply this state. What what does it actually do? Like, um, you know, did, did I get my syntax right? You know, I. I I didn't say I wanted to delete the file, did I? Right, and you just want to kind of step through it, um, having a little, you know, kind of uh, host-only network where you can't really affect production is is kind of a nice thing to have.
I, I have a quick question, actually. I mean, whether or not you want to keep it in recording is another matter. But um, how is this licensed? I mean, I just wondered as a use oh. case, if you wanted to play with it at home, um, could you use it, for example, to to manage your children's laptops? Is there a free version or is it all just, just licensed and you'd have to buy it? Yeah, so... Um um it is part of the vra entitlement so the um actually out you know docsvmware.com there's uh uh you know the vra place is where you would find all of the salt stack config stuff um th there's instructions on how to apply a license key yeah, lcm took care of that for me in one environment in this environment i had to just kind of do it myself um, but you just create like a text file on the file system and you actually just put the VRA key in, right? So the, the vRealize automation key is the, the key that you would use. It, like this is this is really coupled with VRA from a license entitlement standpoint. Um, so I guess, you know, um, you know, if you have VRA licensing, you, you know, any place where you're licensed for VRA, you'd be licensed for salt stack config. Um, you might want to use it to play with your VMUG advantage or something, but, but not, exactly. not something. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, thank you. Well, and, and to build on that, though, uh, I, you know, current state, this is, we do have an option for open source as well. Um, now, you're not going to, as I understand it, you're not going to get the full like UI like we have here with salt, salt stack config, um, but you can still leverage it. So I believe there is, it's a, you know, continues to be, you know, open source free, right? Um, so you can check that out. It's uh, saltproject.io. And it's continuing to be updated and whatever else. So I think there is a, a free path here, just, you know, more traditional, less, uh, less UI. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Like when I launched the the web interface, it told me that I had uh, it was like a month or two weeks or something um, of like grace period before I had to apply a license. Uh, so so this web interface route definitely wanted me to uh, apply a license key. Uh, but like you mentioned, that that kind of command line um, uh, you know, salt project is still a, an option as well. So like those state files, I think would be you know, easy enough to you know, transpose between the two of these, right? Like it's the same language. We just copy and paste them kind of a thing. All right. Cool. Any other, uh, any other questions? All right. Well, gosh, Brian, thank you so much for going through the effort of, you know, developing this and sharing it with the group. This was fantastic. And I know that um, I am super excited to, you know, spend more time with it. Um, and everybody else, thank you for joining. Appreciate, uh, appreciate your being here. And uh, I guess with that, we'll go ahead and end the session and uh, we'll see you at the next TAM lab. Thanks so much. Thanks, Bill.